We've got really a big one coming up next year. The, the Kingdom Divided series, I was looking into it. We're going to cover 15 different books uh, next year. So, I mean, we're not going to do all the books, but we're going to cover passages from them. So if you want to get a head start on some of the minor prophets, that would be a great use of time. Second thing I want to mention is our survey. So now we've got 150 or so survey responses. We want to try to get to a number of 200. So if you guys haven't filled out a survey yet, uh, make sure to fill it out so you don't get kind of left out of your preferences for next year. I passed around some of these invite cards for the women's evening BSF group that's going to be forming on May 2nd. And the women are going to be meeting over here in the chapel. Um, if you have maybe a wife, a sister, a daughter, anyone in your life that's interested in BSF, uh, they don't have to be registered for this. They can just show up. Uh, the children's program will, will take on whatever kids you guys bring. So uh, if you need any more invites, we have some more at the admin table that you guys can pick up as you leave tonight, or you can ask me and I'll give you one of these. But it would be a blessing to them. And I know when I look at this group, I know that most of us in the men's group have been invited by a woman. So now it's our, our turn to actually invite and get their group running. So what a blessing that is. Okay, last thing I will say is I want you to save the date for our victory night or share night as we call it. Uh, that's going to be on May 10th, which is a Tuesday night. Okay, the Monday night, this room is taken, so we're doing the Tuesday night. Um, it's going to start at the same time, which is 6.45 p.m., and we will gather together. I'll do a short devotional. We'll, we'll probably open in worship, and then we will let you guys have the floor, and you guys can share what the Lord has been speaking to you through this study. That is all for my announcements, so let's open in prayer. Lord God, thank you for this passage. Lord, thank you for going to the cross. We're going to take some time tonight and just really study the details here and really reflect on the sacrifice that has been made on our behalf. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see all of the, the verses and all the actions just with fresh perspective. Help us to put ourselves in the middle of this story and to realize that this sacrifice was made for us. Help us to see it with a, with a mind for appreciation and with an open heart ready to receive application. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's look at our map here. So as we finished off last time in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we're going to go next to the Palace of Caiaphas, which is where the trial happens. And then we're going to finish up today in the city of Jerusalem, probably a little bit more towards the western side of Jerusalem, but we will finish there. That's where Pilate is going to um, carry out his part of the trial. Okay, but I'd like to start in the year 1892. So in 1892, there was an 18-year-old Hungarian immigrant whose name was Eric Wise, and he had just lost his father to cancer. Without a breadwinner in his home, his family fell into dire poverty, and it came time for Eric to support his mother and his six siblings. So young Eric began working as a shoe shiner, and he sold papers to put whatever food on the table that he could manage. But the struggle to escape from poverty introduced Eric to something that would become the central theme of his life, breaking free from his bondage. His family's escape from poverty started by moving out of the hard slums of New York City. He moved into a strange and wonderful place that was called Coney Island. It was full of carnivals and magic and weird sideshow acts. And here was the amazing part. There was lots of money to be made for the people who were bold enough to earn it. So this is when Eric decided to, to learn the trade of performing magic. He started by picking up a book by a French magician whose name was Robert Houdin. Besides the book teaching him the various tricks of the industry, it also taught him that magicians must always maintain the upper hand in their act. They must have an advantage in some way. They have to either have a strength that nobody knows about or a knowledge of something or a secret that no one's aware of. 
The upper hand is what sells these illusions, and it makes the impossible become possible. The book that he read was such an inspiration that he used the author's name to create his stage name. From that point on, he would become known as Harry Houdini. He started out with simple card tricks around Coney Island and close-up magic, but he knew right away that if he wanted to be a truly great magician, he was going to have to take it up a level. He was going to have to perform uh, bigger and better tricks. So his breakthrough illusion was called the metamorphosis. It involved being locked in a trunk while, it was buckle, while he was buckled in a straitjacket, and he was also handcuffed around his feet. To the audience's amazement, when he popped out of the box, it was actually his wife that popped out of the box. So over time, Houdini's stunts, they, they gained more notoriety, and, and he earned the title of world-class illusionist. To Houdini, being on top meant constantly chasing the next bigger escape defying greater odds every time, getting into more danger every time. To be on top, he had to push the limits of his body. He, he performed one trick where he, was, he jumped off a bridge into a river while wearing handcuffs. One time, he was suspended upside down in a tank full of water while handcuffed and shackled. One time, he was hung from a crane upside down from a tall building wearing a straitjacket over a crowd. And the one that almost killed him was being buried alive six feet underground without a casket while wearing handcuffs. The, the stunt pictured here was when he decided to be locked in handcuffs and leg irons, nailed into a crate, ro uh, tied with rope, weighed down with 200 pounds, and thrown into the East River. <laughs> in the end, he escaped in 57 seconds. The crate was pulled out of the water and it was fully intact still. So what captivated audiences about Harry Houdini was he walked this dangerous line between impossible odds and defying death. Despite the numerous close calls that he went through, he prevailed every time because he always had the upper hand. It's just like that, that book that he read. He always had a back door. He always had a hidden key or a card up his sleeve or a secret lever. Houdini had a knack for swallowing large items and keys that he would hide in his mouth. So in the middle of the trick, he could kind of reach in there and pull out a key and get out of a, a predicament. So what we learn here is this. Houdini controlled his survival because he controlled his environment. The gotcha in the trick was prepared long before he went on stage. What we learn is that certain victory is the outcome of perfect control. The greater our grasp of control in any situation, the greater our guarantee of success. Let's remember that principle because in Matthew 26, Jesus and his journey to the cross, he played out, that, that, actual, that journey played out differently than what Houdini did. But rather than defying death, what Jesus was doing was inviting death. Victory meant something entirely different and yet the same principle applied. Certain victory is the outcome of perfect control. Jesus demonstrated no less control over his environment. He stepped deeper and deeper into danger, but he was in charge at every moment. He perfectly controlled every brush with death, every insult that he received, every whipping, every beating, every rejection was another opportunity to navigate a path to certain victory. So today in our passage, we're going to gain a greater understanding and appreciation of Jesus' ability to prevail against impossible odds. And ultimately, he's going to prevail over death itself. So in the first section, we'll look at how Jesus prevailed over a, a seemingly chaotic collision with some soldiers and his plan. Roman soldiers and Judas' betrayal seem to take away all of Jesus' control, but it's uh, in the end he realizes that he had control. In the next section, Jesus prevailed in the defense of his deity when interrogated by the Sanhedrin. And then in the last section we're going to cover, Jesus prevailed over questions about his royalty. We learn that the scorn of the crowds and the deadly beatings Jesus faced can't take away one iota of his title as King Jesus. So let's begin in verse 50. So as I said in the map before, we're going to start in the Garden of Gethsemane where we left off last time. 
So Judas and the Sadducees showed up with half an army to arrest a nonviolent man, of all things. So despite Judas' ruthless betrayal, Jesus' last words to him were, were somewhat comforting. He says, do what you came for, friend. The moment played out just like Psalm 41, if you're familiar with this part of the psalm. It says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. So as these soldiers closed in on Jesus slowly after he's been betrayed, John 18 actually records something pretty amazing that that Matthew leaves out. It says, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So the power of Jesus in this moment is unmistakable. And this is the power that he would ultimately choose to restrain the entire journey that he's making to the cross. He would restrain the power because he wanted to go to the cross. Even in his darkest moments, he held back. Psalm 27 shows us that, again, prophecy is dictating the outcome, not the soldiers. Jesus is in control. Psalm 27 says, When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. So as we kind of shift focus in this scene here, Peter responds to the threats that are around him, and he responds very differently than what Jesus does. What Peter sees is dominating what he thinks is going on. How do you determine if God is still in control of the plans that that he's making in your life? Peter's fear of letting down Jesus launches him into attack mode. He sees something wrong. He sees a threat. He knows he wants to be loyal to Jesus, and he's going to fight for it. It's a good thing that Peter has pretty bad aim because he only cuts off the soldier's ear. I'm pretty sure he was aiming for the guy's head. But what we learn is that Peter misses the mark in more than one way. Nothing Jesus ever taught the disciples had to do with fighting. It was never about aggression against the enemy. In fact, you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the opposite. He said, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. How easy is it for you to follow Jesus' teaching in your life when you're all of a sudden under attack? Perhaps many of us would admit that our commitment to Jesus and his teaching is best when we're safe at home. But when we get threatened, when we get punched in the mouth, all bets are off. All of a sudden, we start following human instinct over what we we know that Jesus has taught us. I have a friend that I I talked to uh, a week or two ago uh, who lives in Ukraine, and he's been in the middle of this Ukrainian war. And uh, as we talked, the conversation quickly became about faith. Uh, Before the the war had started, he had a streak in his Bible app that was going for over a thousand days. It was three years long. He said the day that the war began, the day that Russia attacked Ukraine, he broke his Bible streak and he did not read the Bible that day. And he looked back at the moment and he said, why didn't I open the word of God in a moment of stress? Peter's response to an attack demonstrates an unfortunate reality in human nature. In times of threat, many of us rely on survival more than we rely on Jesus. What do you rely on in times of crisis in your life? Jesus, even in the middle of this crisis, he he doesn't waste an opportunity to, to teach a lesson. He instructs Peter to put the sword back and instead defend himself with faith. Here's what verse 53 says. Jesus um, tells him, do you think you, I cannot call on my father and he will put once, at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out uh, with swords and clubs to catch, capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. 
So Jesus makes it clear in this passage that there are going to be no accidents on the way to the cross. Jesus has total grasp of his surroundings. He's got total control of his actions. And by the way, he's got total command of an angel army. In biblical language, we call this situation of of God's control, we call this sovereignty. It means that God is in charge, and when God's plan unfolds, no one can stand in the way of any of it. The sovereignty of God is, is perfect, and it is impossible to change. The scriptures prove that scripture existed first, and it showed it shows the, the plan first, and then the plan plays out accordingly. When we compare God's plan, we can look in the Old Testament and see what was the plan. We can look in the New Testament and see how did it play out, and we have uh, evidence here that God's plan played out perfectly, even more so than maybe we expected. The unexpected details of God's plan challenges us, but the sovereignty of God reassures us. What we can't see is that God is guiding every detail of his plan. So here's my first principle. The unseen authority of God always allows his plan to prevail. So to the average bystander, as you're looking at the the scene in the garden here, It looks like Jesus, he's undermanned, and he's outmatched. The soldiers of the Roman guard, they have superior weapons, they have strength in numbers, and they have surrounded the garden with strategic locations. The chief priests who are there with them, they have legal authority in the scene, and they're present as eyewitnesses to an arrest. And then if you look on the other side of the story, Jesus' disciples are an unpredictable bunch. There's a man that Jesus called friend who is now betraying him. There's a man who Jesus taught about living in peace who is now wielding a sword and hacking off an ear. When all is is said and done, they end up running for the hills around them. So to the outside observer, Team Jesus has become unglued in this moment. But just like Houdini with that that, uh, handcuff key that's hidden in his mouth, Jesus holds an unseen advantage at this moment. His advantage is the authority of God's plan. This advantage is going to lead him reliably to the cross. But here, and here's what no one else around him sees in the moment. This is an unseen authority, as I said. Before being arrested, Jesus spent an intense time of prayer with the Father. And in Gethsemane, he had a complete picture of his Father's will a will that is final and unchangeable and inevitable. No one else can see that Jesus knows the outcome because the Father revealed it. And then what's more, as we said, uh, Jesus knows that there's 12 angel armies that you can't see. They're sitting there behind a spiritual curtain, and they're ready to move as soon as they're called on. So who's really the outmanned one here? And then lastly, Jesus mentioned two times that Scripture has written the outcome of the moment. We know that the events must play out exactly as prescribed in Scripture. No one else in the moment can see the unfailing authority of God's Word. So these three reasons I've just given you are just three of the many reasons that guarantee the result of the moment. Perhaps there are thousands of other hidden reasons that we can't see, and they guard the will of God Suffice it to say, we can have confidence even in the chaos of Jesus' arrest that everything is going perfectly according to plan. The most shocking part of the whole scene is the fact that it involves flawed humans like you and me. We have an amazing knack for messing things up, don't we? And yet, here were the disciples placed front and center in the middle of one of the most important moments in all of human history. Here's how it played out. They were supposed to be praying, and they fell asleep. Peter's ear surgery on a Roman soldier could have led the Romans to kill everyone. And then verse 56 adds the exclamation point. It says, in a moment of of needed support, it says, all the disciples deserted Jesus and fled. Could they have possibly failed worse than what they did? In the end, the climax of Jesus' three-year discipleship for these men 
was a group of scared thugs who became their own worst enemy. It makes me realize, how can any of us be trusted with the work of God when our flawed nature is trying its best to sabotage God, it seems like? A scene like this exposes a giant mystery about how do we fit into the perfect plans of God. God clearly allows men like Peter to act with free will, and yet, despite men like Peter, he achieves his outcome every time. God engineers the arrest of Jesus perfectly to lead him to the cross. So simultaneously, we live and act freely within the guardrails of God's design, and yet God dictates an outcome by his authority. Romans 8.28 is a beautiful verse. It says, and we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Somehow all things God can wield together into a good plan. Not only did the disciples not derail God's plan, God actually heightened the significance of the moment by allowing them to live in free will and to make mistakes. It encourages us today, God involves imperfect people in his work. No matter how strong or how weak you are, you have a valuable role in God's plan. His plan must succeed. So how does the fact that God's authority over even the most difficult situations give you hope? He has this authority that cannot be broken. If God can use even a messy, chaotic event like this for good, for the good of all humanity even, what might God be doing through your hardships today that he is working for good? Let's go into the next section Scripture tells us that Jesus was taken by cover of darkness from Gethsemane to the house of Caiaphas. So Caiaphas is this figure that's going to become very common through the rest of our passage. He was the chairman of the Sanhedrin, and he was also the high priest of the temple. So today, this church on the left-hand side, that is the church that stands where Caiaphas' house would have been. It commemorates this really important event on the way to the cross. And if you go inside this church and look in the lower level of it, you can see this picture on the right-hand side, which is an underground prison system that was in the lower levels. Jesus would have been lowered into this pit by ropes around his waist, and he would be basically you know, forced to stay in the pit until the Sanhedrin could scramble and find various witnesses and assemble the case against him. So Jesus sat in that pit, or a pit just like it, for several hours awaiting that trial. Psalm 88 actually tells us what was going through Jesus' mind in that pit. It says, I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the, dep- in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. So while waiting for that trial, it stands out to me that Jesus is not worried about the wrath of men. He's not worried about how this trial is going to play out. He is worried about the wrath of God at that moment. He was about to endure the hardest thing ever. God's wrath surpasses man's wrath, and also God's justice surpasses man's justice. From the details of how this whole thing unfolds, this trial, we uh, scholars have found that there are at least 18 glaring problems with the trial that they, that they uh, that put on. The 18 reasons uh, that it broke the law, was, it was breaking the Mosaic law. Here are some notable ones. Number one, trials are not supposed to happen in the middle of the night. Number two, the Sanhedrin was not allowed to bring charges against the defendant. It had to be the witnesses bringing the charges forward. Number three, capital crimes couldn't be decided on holy days, and this was on Passover. Number four, the accused person was required to have an advocate, and Jesus had nobody there with him. He was by himself. And then a fifth one that I will mention is that mid-trial, Caiaphas changed the charges in the case from from uh, treason to blasphemy. 
So all these, these are just five of the most glaring things that were wrong about this trial. They were not doing this by the books. Ironically, the men who were so offended by Jesus' Sabbath keeping and his hand washing practices, these are the same people that tore up the law when it came to capital punishment. So you have to dig really deep into the passage to try to figure out why did they have such a bloodthirst for Jesus? It seems like they had, him, they had it out for him. They didn't care how the trial went. They were just going to convict him. They were just trying to push him into the cross. It definitely wasn't because the Sanhedrin was zealous for law. We can see that they weren't even following the law. It wasn't because they thought that Jesus was going to blow up the temple. They could see that there was no evidence for that. And it wasn't because they thought Jesus was going to steal their job. That he had no such ambition of doing that. There was something more to their anger against Jesus and that comes out in their interrogation of him. In verse 62, we kind of get into the meat of this trial. It says, the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. So Jesus' answer in all of the previous questions was, not, was a non-answer. He just said nothing. It was as if he was waiting to swing at the fastball, and here it was. Here's the fastball. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. That was what this was all about. The odd thing about them asking it this way is because there's really nothing in Scripture that says that the Messiah is the Son of God. This is an observation that we realize now as, as we look at Jesus. But in their time, they would have thought that the Messiah was the Son of David. And so none of the, the chief priests or the teachers have been looking in Scripture and trying to figure out how he's the Messiah and the Son of God. They couldn't have of asked it because of scripture, they were just asking it based on what they noticed and what people were saying. So I imagine there's something deep inside of Caiaphas that recognized the significance of Jesus to make a claim like that, that he's possibly the Messiah and the Son of God. He probably heard about the many things that Jesus did that aligned with prophecy. He probably heard that people called him Messiah and they hailed him as Hosanna as he entered into the, the city, and he rode a donkey in Jerusalem, which was prophetic as well. They probably knew about the miracles that he performed. They, they knew that he raised a man from the dead even. But the blindness of Caiaphas led him to seek confirmation by asking a question. He needed to know. He needed to hear it from Jesus' mouth. Or tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. There was a time when Jesus was openly engaged in answering a question like that. There was plenty of time. Whoever wanted to know if he was the Messiah could have asked him that. Come and see, a lot of the disciples would say. They, they invited people to come and ask that question. But at this very moment, the time ran out. This should serve as a warning for many today. Take as much time as you need to figure out who Jesus is, but don't take one second longer than you have to to figure out who is Jesus. At some point, the time for that answer to that question is up. So in verse 64, Jesus responds, you have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So the phrase, you have said so, it was enough of a yes to make him guilty of being Messiah, but it was enough of a non-answer to not indulge their curiosity. So it's, it's a bit frustrating to see Jesus in that situation. I, I'm almost rooting for him to just really let him have it. Show him your power. Explain to them why you're the Messiah. I would, I would love to see it all unfold. Jesus could have healed their spiritual blindness in a moment. But instead, here's what they will see with their eyes in full view. He says, I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. We can know that all the men that were interrogating Jesus in that room, they have all died thousands of years ago. 
On, that, on the day that they died, they had a reunion with Jesus, and they saw him sitting at the seat of judgment. And we can only imagine that their jaws dropped to the floor when they saw Jesus was the one. He was the one seated at the right hand of the Father. What's revealed is this. Just because the Sanhedrin rejected the, the deity of Christ, that wasn't the end of the conversation. Jesus had the last word. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah. He said, before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. So the point I'm making here is that they will all eventually have to stand before Jesus at the right hand, and they will see his true authority. So it's tragic when the Sanhedrin doesn't know Jesus, but it's even more tragic when Peter doesn't claim to know him. And in verse 71, Peter was wandering outside that house of Caiaphas when he openly denied Jesus. Um, as they were asking him, it said, they said, uh, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter's rejection of Jesus allows him to see properly the weaknesses that he has. It was an important teaching moment because Peter was eventually going to go to his death as he followed Jesus in the early church. And he was eventually going to be crucified upside down, as tradition says. But before Peter was ready to die for Jesus, Peter had to be ready to die to himself. In that moment, he realized that Jesus had already seen this whole thing play out. Jesus had already warned him, look, you're going to disown me three times. Jesus' prophecy to Peter ahead of time proves that Jesus was not blindsided by this occurrence. Romans 5 speaks to men like Peter and possibly men like you and I. It says, God demonstrates his, his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ, at this moment, he's already on his way to the cross. He already knows that Peter has, is going to disown him. And he is just as willing to die for Peter the denier as he was willing to die for Peter the disciple. That should speak to all of us. Our, our grace is not dependent on our behavior. It depends on God's love for us, which will prevail over every possible mistake. And then Judas, on the other hand, he has a very different path. Verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. So like Peter, Jesus foretold to Judas how this betrayal was going to happen. Jesus knew about it ahead of time. Like Peter, I imagine it was agonizing to, to, put your, to throw your Savior under the bus like that. But where the paths diverged was the answer to this question, what are you going to do about it? The scripture tells us that he had remorse. And that's a critical word here. In other words, he was sad about what he did, but he wasn't willing to make a change. Repentance is so much more than remorse. Repentance is the, the willingness to want to make a change, to turn away from what we've done that's wrong and to accept God's way. Repentance leads to Jesus. Remorse leads to a noose. Here's what Judas realized before he put the noose on his, his neck. He just sold the Lord of all for the price of a slave. Judas was broken by an important realization. The son of God is worth so much more. How much is Christ worth to you? Let's look at our second division. So Jesus' deity prevails over those who deny him. Caiaphas, Peter, and Judas give us three different pictures of betraying Jesus and denying Christ. One of them never knew him. One of them forgot him, and the other one lost him altogether.
But in all three cases, the lordship of Christ prevailed. We're eager to dismiss these things as ancient history and say, you know, that's not me. I haven't denied Christ, and I won't deny Christ. But rather than thinking of them as ancient history, maybe we should think of them as current events. Because I can guarantee there are men among us who have denied Christ. We will say, not me, or we'll say, it's the man a few seats over for me. Make no mistake, the Lord of all knows who has denied him. But these three portraits they teach us, the Lord sees that denial before it happens. And the Lord made a way for grace before it even happened. So that grace would be immediately available to those who are ready to receive his grace. So let's look at our last section where Jesus is handed off to Rome to be punished. And the punishment at this point, as far as I can tell, I mean, the, the verdict is a little bit messy here, but it's, I guess it's blasphemy. And b- before Roman uh, occupation, the punishment for blasphemy would have been being stoned. So Jesus would have been stoned in a different day and age. But Roman rule meant that Israel lost the ability to carry out capital punishment. They actually had to yield to whatever Rome was going to do. So verse 11, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Caiaphas needed to know if Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, as we said. And now Pilate has a different angle. He wants to know if Jesus is king. This is about royalty. The goal of Jesus' two interrogations was to um, get rid of, to discredit his authority. But it's plain to see Jesus' identity was on trial here, more than any other crime or allegation. The most powerful figures in Jerusalem lined up to ask Jesus a simple question, who are you? Perhaps you have that similar question today for Jesus. What we learn in this interaction with Pilate is that Jesus is selective about who he reveals himself to. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, no one could say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So aside from saying to Pilate, you have said so, Jesus really gives no reply in the whole conversation. The reality is that if Jesus had said anything to Pilate, he would have exonerated himself. The wisdom of Jesus could have pointed out a a crooked part of their law. He could have pointed out, um, he could have showed with power that he was actually a man of authority. The truth of Jesus could have poked holes in every case they could have made against him. But the goal wasn't freedom. The goal was the cross. A single word from Jesus could have jeopardized that. And so he held his tongue and he wore his shackles. Jesus' authority is best wielded in silence so that nothing would stand between him and his cross. So without any words from Jesus, Pilate, not wanting to kill an innocent man, had to get creative now. So he, you know, verse 15 tells us it was the governor's custom to, at the, at the festival, they would release a prisoner that was chosen by a crowd. This was Pilate's chance to get rid of his Jesus problem. In verse 21, Pilate asked the crowd, which of the two do you want me to release to you? So the fate of two men would be decided by this crowd. And here are the two men. We have Jesus Barabbas, and we have Jesus of Nazareth. They have similar names. And it's, it's fascinating. If you look at the name Barabbas, it's made up of two parts. The first part is bar, meaning son. And the second part is Abbas, meaning father. So the guy is literally named Jesus, son of the father. <laughs> and then the other guy, obviously Jesus, son of God. The two men are also differentiated by their crimes. As we said, Jesus is on on trial for blasphemy. And the Gospel of Mark tells us that Barabbas murdered someone while fighting insurrectionists, which means he was a zealot. So remember, the zealots were the ones who wanted to fight Rome. They wanted to take down Rome by force and by murdering and rioting and that sort of thing. 
So it would seem that the choice between these two men, it's kind of a no-brainer. We have one man of peace, and then we have one man that could murder anyone at any moment. And just a few days prior, crowds of people were shouting over Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus heals people, he teaches people, he feeds people, he's law-abiding, he's peaceful. It's a no-brainer. Why not pick him? The alternative guy is a guy who murdered someone, and he picks fights for a living, as I said. But the shocker comes in verse 21. The crowd says, Barabbas, what shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. So what we see is that as quickly as the public embraced Jesus, they also turned on him. The only way I can make sense of that change that took place is that, you know, on Sunday they were yelling out Hosanna, and on Friday they're, they're yelling out crucify him. But the problem is for those people is that Jesus was teaching peace. He was teaching, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. It would take a while to get rid of Rome at this pace. These people wanted independence from Rome, and they wanted it now. What do you urgently want right now? Who or what are you willing to sacrifice to get it? Israel had this fixation on kicking out Rome, and it didn't matter what the the method was. They would take any method that would give them the outcome of kicking out Rome. But here's the kingdom that Jesus was bringing them, that was available to them at that moment. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom that Jesus was promoting satisfied all the needs that they had. They just weren't willing to receive it. At the end of the day, Jesus was not the king that they wanted. His kingdom was less visible than what they were looking for. John 19 adds an extra detail. It says, here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. It was a giant, emphatic, unanimous cry against all Jesus had worked for. We don't want your kingdom, and you aren't our king. In fact, you're better to us dead than alive. But the naysayers remind us that Jesus' Jesus kingdom was for the faithful. Jesus' kingdom will be the last one standing. And so now we, we get to the hardest part of this whole passage. We thought that public rejection and humiliation and imprisonment in a pit, those were the worst parts, but no, it gets worse. Verse 27 tells us that the governor's Uh, soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took a staff and struck him on the head. After they mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and then they led him away to crucify him. The details of a beating like this, it it focuses everything on the kingship of Jesus. They mocked his crown and his scepter. They gave him the scarlet robe of, of kings, and they assaulted his honor. They beat his nobility. They disrespected his worthiness. Matthew doesn't tell us anything about how Jesus responded to this beating, but Isaiah 50 does. It says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard, I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. He didn't open his mouth. He took the punishment, every hit, every whip, and he said nothing. No matter how crushing this beating was or how offensive the insults were, Jesus maintained his composure, and he endured the unbearable with dignity. When his body was empty of strength and when his shame was overwhelming, the strength that he had in that moment was the strength that you could be with him in the kingdom if he could just hold out a little longer. He prevailed against all odds. 
And the strength that he had in him was strength that he received by thinking of you and loving you. Where does your strength come from? Let's look at our last principle. King Jesus prevails over every attack. In the end, Jesus wins every battle that we just witnessed. He protects his plan. He preserves his deity. He defends his throne. The short-sighted observer looks at this whole thing and sees defeat on every turn. But the intimate follower of God sees the sovereignty of God prevailing through difficult trials. God's sovereignty reminds us that the cross was not a backup plan. This was plan A. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1, this was plan A. Where does the difficult journey to the cross lead you and I today? Matthew 16 gives the answer, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Jesus' road to the cross reminds us that worldly victory and godly victory look very different. Prevailing in this world is going to look very different than prevailing in the kingdom of God. When God's plan is carried out, when God's true nature is worshipped, when the king of kings is placed on his throne, that's where we stand with Christ in his most desperate hour and bear witness to love winning over hate. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the cross. As we get closer and we witness this beating and we witness the rejection and the humiliation, we're reminded that it is not popular to follow the King of Kings. And we live in a world that is is dark and jaded and corrupt. And we know that the way and the truth and life is in your Son. So Lord, I pray that we would focus our lives all the more on the one who who won our victory. And we would just focus our our hope and, and our joy on that victory and that we would take up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, everyone.